We are talking hormones and gut health and the connection between the two and all sorts of invaluable information from a traditional naturopathic doctor named Dr. Lisa Pomeroy on the show today. I had to seek her out as a guest after doing a training of hers and seeing her on other trainings. I do a lot of continuing education type things and I'm just blown away by her. She is like walking encyclopedia, like wisdom, insanely knowledgeable about this and many other things in health. So I had to introduce you guys to her today. Um, so she is a, has extensive training in functional medicine, lab test interpretation, and gut microbiome rebalancing. In addition to uh, being a graduate of the Kalish Institute Mentorship Program, she is a certified microbiome analyst she currently works as a clinical consultant for Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory and educates health practitioners on functional lab test interpretation through her business, Pomeroy Institute for Functional Nutrition. And you can check that out at pomeroyinstitute.com. If you'd like to learn more, she does do mentorships and trainings for other practitioners. She's amazing. Um, and she does have courses for health practitioners on interpreting the GI map test and interpreting the Dutch test, if that's something that interests you. Otherwise, we're going to learn all about the insights gained on these tests and uh, many other invaluable things about our, our gut and what's going on and what kind of symptoms, what kind of things can be going on in our bodies that we might not realize are connected to our gut and also how uh, we can find out more about how our hormones actually work, the, the metabolites going into the pathways that they're going down. It's more than just getting a blood test, right? We can learn a lot more than that um, through some of the tests, testing that she's gonna talk about today and we'll kick that off with the Dutch test. So yeah, lots of info coming your way. And before we get in, I do wanna remind you, if you missed it on the last episode, um, that I, you guys know I very rarely allow podcast sponsors, okay? So I've said no to many, many things. And I just pay for this podcast out of my own pocket, but um, I did have an offer from Paluva Shoes to do a podcast sponsorship. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll do it because I have just been blown away by these shoes. They do have the five toe articulation. So they are separated, which I will be real was a barrier for me at first. Cause I thought it looked nerdy, <laughs> but after wearing them, I don't think it looks nerdy anymore. I'm kind of like proud to rock them because I have been blown away by how much that has created the freedom in my movement, the dynamic movement through my feet to be able to just really operate they were the way they were meant to. And they have some that I wear to the gym and then I got some with deeper tread that I've been wearing hiking and I've just been falling in love with those. So if you'd like to try them out, I have a coupon code and it's 15% off, which is a little deeper. Usually they only offer, offer 10. So 15% off and the code is Coach Tara and you can just use that coupon code at paluva.com. That's P-E-L-U-V-A. Dot com. All right, let's go ahead and get into the show. Here is Dr. Lisa Pomeroy. All right. So Lisa, I am like very excited to get into all this. I'm going to try to talk as little as possible um, <laughs> because you're just such a wealth of information. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to my people today. No problem. Any chance I have to talk about hormones or gut, I, I love geeking out on that kind of stuff. I know you do. I can tell <laughs> you have geeked out a lot. You're very knowledgeable. So um, let's start, let's start with hormones. We're really going to get into gut. So guys, if that's what you're listening to, and probably this hormone thing will kind of teeter into gut also, because obviously they're connected. Um, but you know, I did the training that you gave on the Dutch test, and I know a lot of people have had interest in that. And I'm curious if you could give a brief overview of what the Dutch test is, or, you know, even just the urine and cortisol components of that and what kind of things people can find out from a test like that. Yeah, so the Dutch test is unique in that it's a urine test, actually a dried urine test for hormones. You know, a lot of people are familiar with the serum tests where you go and get a blood draw and that can give you some valuable information, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you always the total big picture. You know, we know when we're talking hormones, like especially estrogen, you know, it's not only how much estrogen do you have, but how are you actually metabolizing it? And the only way you can tell how you're metabolizing your hormones is through the urine. Yeah. So, you know, both blood and urine can tell you, okay, this is how much estrogen we see. But then the question is, okay, you know, you have so much estrogen, are you processing it in a healthy way or an unhealthy way? 
Yeah. Um, we talk about phase one estrogen metabolism and not to get too complicated, but you know, there's three main pathways that estrogen goes through. One we call the two hydroxy pathway, or you'll see two hyphen OH. Another is the four hydroxy pathway, and there's a 16 hydroxy pathway. So what we're hoping to see is the majority of your estrogen is getting metabolized down that 2-hydroxy pathway. That's more of that good protective estrogen metabolite, so more of the anti-cancer metabolite. The one we especially don't want to see get too high is the 4-hydroxy metabolite. That's the one that actually can damage DNA, cause addicts, and that could lead to situations like breast cancer. So again, we don't want to see the percentage of that get too elevated. And then there's the 16-hydroxy metabolite. That one, it's kind of a Jekyll and Hyde metabolite. It's good in some ways, bad for other ways. I like how some practitioners will say it's good for bones, it's bad for boobs. <laughs> so, you know, for bone health, you want 16, you want some 16 hydroxy yeah. metabolites because you need it for good, healthy bones. But mm -hmm. then on the flip side, you get too much 16 hydroxy metabolites and it's very estrogenic. And so you could see breast tenderness, you could see endometriosis, um, terrible PMS, crampy, heavy, clotty periods, things like that. So again, we want to see the balance and the beauty of the urine testing with the Dutch is that we can actually see how much estrogen do you have, but even more importantly, I would say, is how are you actually breaking it down? Yeah. What in, in that phase one detox, like what are some things that cause estrogen to go down these different pathways? And how can someone, yeah. you know, preemptively, I guess I'd say, like <laughs> try to favor that 2OH pathway? Yeah. Now some is genetics. Now genetics, we can't change. So we'll talk about what we can change. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of it is toxic chemicals and, you know, environmental toxicants is what can tend to make us go down the, the 4-hydroxy pathway. So a lot of times it is trying to, you know, have a healthy lifestyle, not having a bunch of, you know, chemical laden cleaning supplies and eating clean foods, having purified water, you know, because things like, you know, BPA and phthalates and a lot of these chemicals that could be in our, you know, our makeup products, our cleaning products, I mean, air fresheners, perfumes, you know, those toxic products will tend to cause things to go more down that 4-hydroxy pathway. 16-hydroxy, mm -hmm. um, you know, to talk about the gut a little bit, 16-hydroxy uh, will, you know, that prefer preferentially will go down that pathway a little bit more if there's gut inflammation. Mm. And so that's where sometimes I'll see that where someone is heavily favoring the 16-hydroxy pathway. And it's like, I want to see a stool test on you because I want to see, is there some gut inflammation that's driving all this estrogen to go down that way? Mm -hmm. And before we kind of segue into that gut inflammation piece, um, I think it's noteworthy to talk about the phase two. Can you talk about the phase two of this mm -hmm. whole process? And what things yeah. people might want to be aware of. Let's say they got a Dutch test. I mean, they would do it through a practitioner anyway. So, you know, they would find out, but just for curious minds, like what else can they find out about their estrogen metabolism, for example, on a Dutch test in that phase yeah. two? Yeah. So the liver is doing phase one and phase two. Now, phase two, we have several different processes. So there's methylation, there's sulfation, there's glucuronidation. Now, when we're talking about estrogen, we're often talking about methylation. And that's where that, again, say you make too many of those nasty 4-hydroxy metabolites. Well, you can essentially take the teeth out of it if you methylate it. And so it's like the body, there's a lot of built-in redundancy where if plan A doesn't go according to, you know, it doesn't work, yeah. the body has a plan B, it has a plan C. Yeah. So methylation steps in and kind of neutralizes those bad estrogen metabolites so they don't cause harm. Yeah. Now, of course, methylation relies heavily on B vitamins, you know, whether we're talking like B6 and folate and B12. So we need to have good nutritional intake through the diet, good absorption, good digestion mm -hmm. to have those nutrients we need for methylation. 
curious if just throwing this out there in your in your experience have you come across people with like a slow com t or mthfr mutations and you see that show up in their uh in their phase two there that they're not able to methylate those well do you see that do you do you t- test for those i do often yeah things? and do you see that correlate quite a bit or how what's your experience there I do, especially in resistant cases where we're doing mm-hmm. a lot, we're maybe supplementing with the B vitamins and it's like, it's just that methylation that they're little fan gauges. And it's like, yeah. this is just not budging. This should be yeah. budging. And that's what we start to think is if things aren't responding, there may be something genetic getting in the way mm-hmm. where you may need more than the average person right. for these methylated B vitamins. Right. So that's where we may have to push things up. But yeah, I definitely see it where again, genetics can play a role. If you have a slow comp T, then I mean, mm-hmm. again, if you produce a lot of 4-hydroxy estrogen metabolism, metabolites, you have a slow com T that's supposed to be methylating those four hydroxy. It's going to add, you know, add up to a bad situation. Mm-hmm. Yep. And of course, yeah, my, MTHFR. Yep. That's another one that again, yeah. one of those genes of many that are involved in methylation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My, my grandma, my dad's mom died when she was younger than I am now. She was 40 from breast cancer and I have a slow com T. And so I, oh, I always wonder, you know, I'm like, man, I wonder what would have happened if maybe she could have had a Dutch test when she was like 30, you know? Yeah. It's so common. <laughs> I'm in the same boat, slow comp tea. You know, it's just, mm-hmm. yeah. It's so, so common. You just, yep. And so you just have to know how is that going to affect you? Yeah. You know, you, you can't right. break down estrogen that well. And you yeah. also can't break down, you know, like epinephrine, norepinephrine. Right. So you might be someone who tends to get a little more anxious because when you get scared or startled and you produce all that, say, epinephrine, mm-hmm. you can't break it down very well. So you mm-hmm. probably don't like, you know, you're not going to be a thrill seeker. You're not going bungee jumping. You're not going on roller coasters because <laughs> you don't feel so good afterwards. <laughs> yeah. If I get mega crazy, stressful event, like Tara's not going to sleep for a long, long time. Nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Thanks so much. All right. So can you share a little bit about your background with gut health, just so people have some context? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm I'm trained as a traditional naturopath, but you know, due to my own health issues, I kind of had to go down the rabbit hole and investigate all these different areas. Um, so gut was something that I had long-standing gut issues. You know, I would as a child, I would just vomit out of the blue. And my parents would think, oh, she's coming down with the flu, cancel the birthday party. And then it's I'm fine. And then it's like, okay, well, why are we having these vomiting episodes? And I have a fuzzy, uh, kind of a fussy stomach. And then, you know, seventh grade, I'm starting to get ulcer-like pain. And Mm -hmm. it's just always in a lot of food reactivity. And you're just thinking, what's going on? But, you know, I had to, you know, study this for myself and then learn about the functional lab tests to figure out, okay, what actually is going on in there? I mean, without lab testing, it's like, yes, I can try hydrochloric acid supplements. I can try enzymes. Sometimes I can try DGL licorice. I could just, you know, try all those, you know, just we'll do the, everything but the kitchen sink approach. Mm-hmm. But when I test it, it's like, okay, I have a ton of parasites. I have H. pylori in my stomach, which mm-hmm. makes sense why I would kind of vomit out of the blue. I was getting mm-hmm. the ulcer-like pain, especially when I stressed. And it's mm-hmm. like everything started to fill in, you know, it's like, okay, this makes sense. And it took me a while to get through. I mean, I had a little, you know, more parasites than the average person because <laughs> you know I'm, I'm from Minnesota and it's a hotbed of Lyme here and unfortunately mm. I did pick up Lyme and Bartonella mm. so those were other infections I needed functional lab testing to determine right. but it, it really knocked down my immune system so mm. then I just you know you, you eat food there are pathogens on food and right. you, just, you pile up infection after infection after infection yeah yeah and this, when were you kind of starting to figure this out? Like what year was this? Cause I, oh, there, gut yeah. health has just exploded. Right. So even like five years ago, like we didn't know as much as we know now, like not even close. I feel like yeah. 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. I mean, back in the late nineties when I was exploring this, wow. I mean, it was like, there was like <laughs> One stool company out there that everybody right. used. So it's like you had to really look. Yeah, yeah. And people would only think of doing a stool test if there were gut issues. 
So it's right. like, okay, you have diarrhea, you have constipation, you have abdominal pain, we'll do a mm -hmm. stool test. Mm -hmm. But it's like, now we recognize, you know, how the gut microbiome is connected with everything. Mm -hmm. So it might be that you have rosacea or psoriasis, you have some yeah. skin issue, I'm looking at your gut. You right. have headaches, I'm looking at your gut. You have PCOS, a hormonal issue, I'm looking at your gut. So now it's expanded and there's all these labs now that will do stool testing with different technologies. So we can explore this and it has become popular. And in the studies, that's what they are now connecting. They have, you know, the gut brain axis, the, you know, the, the gut skin axis, and it's just everything connecting the mm -hmm. dots going back to the gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Psoriasis and skin conditions, rashes, um, to thyroid issues. Like I'm trying to think, you know, what are, let's, let's clarify. You listed a few, but some people, people who aren't into this, they're not, you know, they're not gut <laughs> people. They're not studying this on their own independent time that might catch this episode. What are some, uh, things that could be connected? I know it's kind of like everything, but some obvious things that could be connected to poor gut health that aren't like, oh, I'm getting super bloated or I have constipation or, you know, mm -hmm. loose stools chronically or whatever. Yep. Yeah. So things like say, you know, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's yeah. very common these days. I had Hashimoto's myself. <laughs> so again, just, you know, one of those things I had to figure out, you yeah. know, for me, it was gluten that triggered my Hashimoto's. So I just had to go gluten free and that put my Hashimoto's in remission. Nice. But when I'm looking at a stool test with a lot of people, it's H. pylori. You know, that's a mm. stomach infection, but it's been highly linked with both Hashimoto's and Graves disease. So mm. both thyroid autoimmune conditions. So, but Hashimoto's, H. pylori is one I'm always looking for on a test. And then there's a little parasite that lives in your colon called Blastocystis hominis. That's another one linked with Hashimoto's. Mm. Uh, there's a bacteria called Yersinia. I don't see it all that often, but again, it's one that I'm checking for because, you know, it might be gluten, but it could be a parasite, could be an H. pylori, could be a bacteria. You know, those are the, the checklist I'm going down for a Hashimoto's client. Mm -hmm. Now, say I have a rheumatoid arthritis client. Well, now I'm thinking different bugs. Now, H. pylori has been linked with rheumatoid arthritis too. So I do want to look at that. Mm -hmm. But then I'm also looking for certain bacteria like Citrobacter or Klebsiella, or mm. Proteus, you know, mm. so there's certain species that, you know, can create, more, they can trigger autoimmunity and seem to have an affinity for triggering it in certain areas, like those are more of the joints. Mm. What else? What else? How about, uh, you know, brain fog, uh, poor memory, you know, a lot of brain stuff, like, where does your mind go with that in terms of the gut? Yeah, a lot of potential things, but number one for <laughs> brain fog, I think yeast, <laughs> okay. I think candida, mm. because candida produces a lot of toxins. One of them is called acetaldehyde. Now, a lot of people know if you drink too much alcohol, you feel a little hungover the next morning, and you kind of have that brain fog type feeling. Well, that's acetaldehyde. You know, when your body is detoxifying alcohol, it creates this breakdown product called acetaldehyde. Well, candida also produces acetaldehyde. Mm -hmm. So that same hungover feeling that you feel from alcohol is what candida can cause for you when there's too much of it. Mm -hmm. So if someone tells me they're having a lot of sugar cravings and there's a lot of brain fog, they're searching for words, mm -hmm. you know, those types of things, Mm -hmm. Candida is the first thing I look for. Mm. Now, I do look for other things too. I mean, there's many things that I think of. I mean, part of it could be digestion, actually, because we do need, you know, nutrients, you know, for a clear brain. A lot of B vitamins are important. So if you're not yeah. digesting and breaking down your food, yeah. you're not going to have sufficient nutrients. Um, I look for things like, you know, there are some good bugs in the gut that make, what they do is they basically eat fiber and they produce a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. And butyrate is something that it's made in the gut, but it actually goes through the gut. You know, as long as the gut has enough for its needs, some of it goes systemic, some of it crosses the blood brain barrier and it calms down the microglia. You know, there's certain like immune cells in the brain that can get overreactive and cause a lot of inflammation. But then it also stimulates something called BDNF. 
That stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And some people refer to BDNF as like miracle grow for the brain. So it helps stimulate memory and cognition. Mm -hmm. So again, I look at maybe candida is producing toxins, impairing the, the brain and how it's functioning, but maybe you don't have enough good guys in your gut to make butyrate to then get across your blood brain barrier and stimulate BDNF. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're not eating enough fiber. Maybe you have yeah. maybe antibiotics, you know, those butyrate producers are so sensitive to antibiotics. Maybe you just really knocked them down from that last course of antibiotics. And again, we just have to build them back up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned headaches or maybe migraines. What are, where did your mind go with migraines and the gut connection to the gut? Yeah, there's certain histamine producing bacteria in the gut. Now with high histamine, you could see headaches and migraines. You could see joint pain. You could see skin issues, um, sinus issues. You know, we always think of high histamine, my, the antihistamine medications, right. just kind of that sneezy, sniffly, drippy type feeling. But you yeah. could also have more like gut pain and gut discomfort. But there's this particular microbe. It just, it doesn't get enough respect. It's called Morganella. Now, mm. the thing is, it's not tested on a lot of stool tests because it's considered a low abundance organism, which means that it's not present in super high percentages. And a lot of tests don't have the capability with their technologies to go down that low mm. to find those low abundance organisms. Mm. But it is something, it's called a super producer of histamine. So mm. when I'm looking for someone who has headaches, I'm especially looking for Morganella. I found it in a lot of migraine patients, but it not only produces a boatload of histamine, so you have just this little histamine generating factory in your gut, but it also breaks down proteins into other amines. So there's histamine, but there's also tryptamine. Tryptamine, there's actually a whole strategy for migraines where you're avoiding high tryptamine foods. Now, mm. again, you could you know, remove the aged cheeses, remove all of those high tryptamine foods. But you, if you have an organism in your gut that will eat the protein that you're eating and produce high mm. levels of tryptamine, you can still get the migraine from that. Wow. So that's what I'm looking for. Klebsiella, you know, that one I already mentioned earlier could trigger some arthritis issues, but it also is a super producer of histamine. So mm. again, something it could trigger headaches and migraines in a lot of people. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. Let's talk about, um, uh, body composition, you know, what you're being able to be metabol metabolically healthy, lose body fat regularly, gain muscle, whatever. What are some of the gut connections there? Yeah. And of course, you know, the GLP one agonist medications are all the rage right now. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a healthy gut actually produces or should be producing GLP-1. And so we have to look at the organisms that produce that to see if they're sufficient. And in a lot of people, we see that they're quite low. Mm. Now, one of them is called acromantia or acromantia mucinophila. Now, this organism, it's kind of an oddball, you know, when we call it, come to gut organisms, because most bacteria eat fiber. What this one eats, it actually eats the mucus that lines your colon. So you need to have a good, healthy mucosal lining, but it likes polyphenols too, but more specifically polyphenols from red and purple fruits. So if you don't have a good colonic mucosal lining, you're not eating like your cranberries and pomegranates and the things that promote its growth, it can be quite low. And that acromantia is something that low levels in studies have been linked with insulin resistance and diabetes and weight gain and obesity. And part of the reason why that can low levels can create those conditions is it is a major stimulator of GLP-1. And then butyrate. I already mentioned butyrate, how important butyrate is for your gut and your brain. Well, another thing that these butyrate producing microbes do when they eat fiber and produce butyrate, butyrate will also stimulate intestinal cells to make GLP-1. So mm. again, if you're on a low fiber diet, you've had antibiotics that's wiped them out. You know, they're also very fussy. They're sensitive to inflammation. So if your gut's inflamed, they're not going to be happy either. So if all of those conditions are in place and your acromancy is low, your butyrate producers are low, you just can't make GLP-1. 
and you're probably going to gain some weight. Mm, wow. Thanks. Let's take a second for SIBO just because I've noticed that sometimes when I, you know, I'll say SIBO and people will be like, you know, they're typing on social media, like what's SIBO? What's SIBO? You know, so I'm like, okay. <laughs> so can we just clarify real quick uh, for people what SIBO is, you know, uh, maybe a quick dive into the different types and what just a basic understanding, just so people can be aware, like, oh, maybe that's what's going on. <laughs> you know, because we, I, I'm sure you run into that. They're like, I've never even heard of this. I just know that this bloating sucks and this yeah. all sucks really bad. <laughs> yeah. So a quick yeah. overview on SIBO, if you don't mind. Yeah. So SIBO or S-I-B-O stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So basically it's bacteria are overgrowing in your small intestine. Now, there are some bacteria that naturally live in the small intestine, so it isn't mm. sterile. You know, researchers once thought that we really didn't mm. have much bacteria in the stomach and small intestine. And it's true that compared to the colon, there's mm. way less bacteria in those areas, mm. but there still is some. And so mm. the problem is whether we're talking in the colon or the small intestine, if you get too many bacteria overall or an imbalance of bacteria, I actually like to look a little beyond, you know, the definition of SIBO is getting a little too narrow for me. You know, mm. they are looking specifically at gas producing organisms in the small intestine. Mm -hmm. Well, I want like Morganella, I already mentioned how nasty Morganella is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't produce gases. It doesn't make hydrogen. It doesn't make, you know, it, it's not a hydrogen or methane producer, mm -hmm. yet it is super nasty and it's in the small intestine. Oh, wow. So for me, I don't like to look just, I feel like I'm just confining myself to a little box if I'm oh, looking at wow. just a handful of organisms in the small right. intestine that produce these specific gases. I <laughs> gotcha. Because if something produces tons of histamine or tryptamine or LPS, yeah. which is lipopolysaccharide, that's highly inflammatory. Yeah. I don't care whether it produces gases or not. It's yeah. causing harm. It's causing symptoms. Right. So for me, I just want to know, is there small intestinal dysbiosis? Right. Which means that we have too many bugs that maybe natural, like Morganella, can live in the small intestine, Pseudomonas can live there, Klebsiella can live there, but there should be teeny tiny little amounts there. If there, if we get too many of them, then they cause a lot of trouble because they produce these harmful byproducts. Yeah. But also like lactobacillus is a good guy that lives in the small intestine. Maybe mm. we don't have enough of that. So I'm looking mm. at overall yeah. of the things that live in the small intestine, are some things too high? Are some things too low? Is there mm. an imbalance? So I want to look at that broader view to, to, because I'll see some people come back and it's like their breath test is normal. And then I do a stool mm -hmm. test and it's like, well, there's small intestinal dysbiosis. There's, mm. you know, really problematic non-gas producing microbes that are known to live in your small intestine that I see really mm. massively overgrowing. Is small intestinal dysbiosis already like an official term? I feel like you can coin it, if not a <laughs> Lisa Pomeroy's no, contribution yeah. <laughs> to go. Does it make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we usually we just say like dysbiosis, which is just an imbalance. So a lot of times right. the term dysbiosis, people have used it for the colon. But right. I think we should be using small intestinal dysbiosis and colonic cool. dysbiosis. I like that. So I think we need to go broader because again, yeah. I think going too narrow, you're going to miss too many things. Yeah, I like that. Okay. And then um, I was wondering if you could describe the difference from your point of view, if someone has, is having gut issues or maybe something that could be correlated to their gut and they're going to go to like a typical primary care physician, um, what kind of lab testing that they might find there, what kind of approach they might find there versus if they were to come do like the GI map, which you, you know, that's your thing or another more functional test like that. Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the difference in the mindset there on the testing? Yeah. And that's where testing, like some tests, say I want to test someone's thyroid function. You know, uh -huh. it really, you could test your TSH and their free, free T3 and your free T4 at any lab, you know, lab mm -hmm. core quest. I mean, they're all pretty much the same, you know, they're all good just tests for those markers. Mm -hmm. Not so much with stool testing, you know, every lab is using different technology mm -hmm. and even using the same technology, they have different, you know, testing kits. So there's different sensitivity and specificity. Yeah. So some are just not as accurate as others, Okay, but 
typically what you're going to get, you know, you're say you you think you have a parasite. And so your doctor, say you're able to convince your doctor to even test your poop <laughs> for a parasite, you know, they're probably going to do what's called an O and P. And that stands for ova and parasite. And what that is, it's a microscopic analysis. So this is a person who, unfortunately, again, in a standard lab, probably hasn't received, you know, in the U.S., we don't really think about parasites all that much. So technicians yeah. are not really trained as expert parasitologists how to identify things. Mm. So we really, I mean, it is really highly dependent upon the skill of the technician. And wow. so, you know, and parasites, when you are looking for them under the microscope, you know, part of it is they do need to be visually identified. So you need a whole intact organism to visually identify under the microscope. The problem is that parasites, you pass them out in the stool, they start to degrade. And so it's much harder to find a whole intact organism than a piece of an organism. And right. so that's where, you know, OMP, you know, there are still values because sometimes you get mm -hmm. some weird, funky parasite from Africa or something. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like on a DNA assay test. And so you're not looking for it where an OMP could find it because you're just looking for anything that's showing up. But if the technician is not an expert parasitologist and, you know, again, if you're, unless you're collecting multiple stool samples, because again, these things are shed very inconsistently, not every day, they often are shed in pieces and they can't be identified visually. It's really hard to find them with that technology. Mm. So what I prefer is the GI map, which is what it is, is QPCR technology. And that stands for quantitative polymerase chain reaction. So basically it's going down to that DNA level. So there are specially designed probes that are looking for that exact DNA fingerprint for that specific microbe. So mm -hmm. we know that, you know, just like people, their DNA is unique to them with the organisms in our gut, each organism's DNA is unique to them. Now, the beauty of that technology is that you don't need that whole intact organism. It's like, you know, CSI, the crime scene, where it's like, you don't need the person there <laughs> to know they did the crime. You just yeah. need a piece of their fingernail, you know, a, a single hair, and you mm -hmm. know they were there. There's a piece of mm -hmm. them. So that's where the DNA, if we can find just a little fragment of them, yeah. we know they're there. So it's a lot easier to find them. Right. We don't need as many samples. It doesn't matter if they started to break themselves down. We can see them much easier. So it is a great technology where we do pick up quite a bit more pathogen wise because mm -hmm. that technology, it really has a great sensitivity and specificity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also looking for the good guys too. I find that to be a difference, right? Like maybe I have a client that's come to me and they're like, oh, I went to like the ER and they ran this thing. And mm -hmm. it's just a short list of just basically looking for something that's going to kill them. Right. <laughs> Yep. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, well, we should probably see how, how abundant your healthy populations are too. And like, you know, start looking at signs of poor function. Like we can start to see if maybe you're not digesting your proteins well, and you're giving off a lot of ammonia or hydrogen sulfide or things like that. Right. So, yeah. Um, and and that's, what, I mean, pathogens, there's one type of testing for pathogens, but bacteria, that's where kind of the old mainstay was culture-based technology. Well, the problem is, again, culture is, you know, most bugs in your gut don't like oxygen and they have certain food preferences. So you take them out of the gut, you plop them on a Petri dish in an oxygen rich environment with a food source they may or may not like, and you see what grows. Right. Well, the problem is only 5% of the organisms in your gut will grow oh, out on a whoa. Petri dish. So you're whoa. going to miss 95% of the organisms in your gut. <laughs> And wow. that's where something like acromancia, I talked about how important acromancia it is, you know, if it's low, you could see insulin resistance, leaky gut, psoriasis, all sorts of problems. Well, they just discovered that little bug in 2004, because it hates oxygen. 
You wow. cannot culture that little bug. Wow. So until technology caught up and we had these DNA assays to run, we couldn't even know that this thing was there. Now, wow. like E. coli, E. coli cultures really well. It's a pig. It eats lots of different foods. It, it doesn't mine oxygen. You know, we've <laughs> known about E. coli since like the late 1800s. So, you know, E. coli, a <laughs> grow like crazy on a Petri dish. Acromancia, none. And so that's where, again, wow. this technology, whether you're looking for the good guys or the bad guys, so acromancy yeah. be a good guy, E. coli a bad guy, you know, you can't culture out these microbes and expect to get a good sense of what's going on in the microbiome. Wow. Okay, let's hit lastly, a little connection on like the gut and hormones specifically. I know we kind of talked about this already, but like, I don't know, I guess because I feel like I'm kind of in the front lines of, you know, people on social media and stuff and the, the things I'm hearing people say, like that maybe they're not working with anybody, right? Like maybe they haven't, it's new to them or they just haven't been able to financially get there or whatever it is. Like I hear these comments a lot of like, I think it's my hormones. I think it's my hormones. I think it's my hormones. I think it's my hormones <laughs> on everything. And I'm like, it, yeah, I mean, I, you're, <laughs> you're probably right. Um, we, and I can't say for sure. But then as I get into it, sometimes with people, I learned that I, I'm constantly hearing all this gut stuff, whether it's from thyroid to just general fatigue to PMS, you know, like how often are you seeing this going on with, especially women, I'm sure guys mm -hmm. too, but like, you know, for at least maybe I live in a bit of an echo chamber because of what I do for a living, you know, so <laughs> it may have like completely warped my world view. <laughs> But I feel like this is like a really big thing right now is like gut, gut issues correlating with hormone issues, especially for women. How do you feel about that? Yeah, exactly. And that's where, I mean, we have to look at the whole person. It's essential yeah. because, I mean, so many people specialize in one area or another. You know, you have people yeah. looking at the gut, people looking at hormones. And I say that you have to understand both to understand one another because right. the gut health really influences hormonal balance. And it also goes both ways. You know, hormonal yeah. balance can yeah. also influence gut health. Yeah. But especially, I mean, I recently did a whole hour long webinar explaining how, you know, when things go wrong in your gut, it could manifest as hormone imbalance. I watched it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and there's so much. I mean, I had to like cut myself amazing. off because it's like, oh, I mean, the more you dig, the more you find. And it's like, here they've connected certain, you know, microbes, what they call microbial signatures. Like these are high and these are low in women with PCOS and women with uterine fibro fibroids, women with unexplained infertility, you know, women with endometriosis. And so they're finding that the gut is actually driving a lot of these conditions. And one way that it's, you know, it seems to be a, you know, a key component of how the gut can influence hormones, especially estrogen, is through the production of an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. So what this enzyme does, like, let's go back to our phase one and phase two estrogen metabolism. So, okay, your estrogen, you make your estrogen, it goes through phase one, and then it goes through phase two. Well, we talked about methylation, but there's also another pathway that estrogen goes down called glucuronidation. So you can picture this as, okay, the liver's gotten done with the estrogen. You know, this estrogen has been used by the body. It's done its job. So now the body has to get rid of it. And so the body, you know, puts the estrogen in a box, you know, puts the lid on the box, ties a ribbon around the box to keep the lid on. It's all packaged up nice and pretty, sends it off into the GI tract, and you're supposed to poop it out and get rid of it. Well, beta-glucuronidase is an enzyme that's made by certain bacteria in the gut. And we do want some, we just don't want too much because beta-glucuronidase is like a pair of scissors. So if you have too much of this beta-glucuronidase enzyme in your gut, because there's too many bacteria in your gut producing that enzyme, mm. they come around going crazy with their scissors. They snip the ribbon off the box, lift the lid, and let mm. the estrogen out of the box. Mm. And so now instead of getting rid of that estrogen like we should, the estrogen gets reabsorbed through the gut goes back into circulation and builds up. So you could become estrogen dominant because not because you make too much estrogen, but you can't eliminate it properly. 
So again, we're looking for, I mean, it could be a woman with breast tenderness, you know, heavy, clotty, crampy periods, you know, all of those symptoms. And of course, the more estrogen you have, the longer it's circulating in the system. There is a link with disorders like endometriosis, but also with breast cancer. So, I mean, we need yeah. some estrogen. We don't want too much. So again, if there's too much beta-glucuronidase, you could end up with too much estrogen, which could have negative effects. Yeah. And the solution for that is just rebalancing, right? Like bringing up some of the healthy populations. Is there anything specific else mm -hmm. that, I mean, on a general way on a <laughs> podcast, you know what I mean? It's hard to say because everyone has a different thing going on, but you know. Yeah. And that's where, you know, while we measure like the estrogen metabolites in the urine, the way you measure beta-glucuronidase is through the stool. So that's where we can pair those two tests together mm -hmm. where I can go, okay, cool. beta-glucuronidase is high. Now I'm looking at the bacteria. Do we have high levels of beta-glucuronidase producers? Yeah. If so, we need to bring them down. Now, yeah. in some cases, we may use some antimicrobial herbs. In some cases, they're just getting too much to eat because you're not digesting your food properly. Mm -hmm. So it could be, I just need to bring in some enzymes and some bile support and some hydrochloric acid. If we mm -hmm. can get that person to digest their food better, there's less, they're not getting an all you can eat buffet of food to mm -hmm. overgrow on and then produce too much beta-glucuronidase. And then I look mm -hmm. at the person's diet because too much animal protein and fat can lead to excessive beta-glucuronidase mm -hmm. or low fiber can lead to excessive beta-glucuronidase. So depending on their diet, I may have to shift things away from if they're just pounding the animal protein, let's dial back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's get our fruits and veggies and whole grains and beans and those types of things. Let's boost those up. Mm -hmm. Or chemicals. It could also be toxic chemicals. Um, could be you like to eat a bunch of grilled meat, high temperature cooked meat. You're drinking out of a, a water bottle with BPA. You know, those things can also cause beta glucuronidase to go up. So again, I'm looking at dial, diet. I'm looking at lifestyle. I'm looking at their, their gut bugs. I'm working on all of that. And if I need a Band-Aid solution, I may use the supplement calcium deglucurate. Basically, it's going to prevent the beta glucuronidase from working. It's going to like put the, you know, it's going to cover up that scissors so it can't go snip, snip. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. little box is going to continue on and you're going to poop it out. I call it a Band-Aid because it doesn't fix the right. problem. So you still right. have to fix the problem. You got to figure out why beta-glucuronidase mm -hmm. is high. But at least, I mean, say we have a woman who, I mean, every month she's doubled over with menstrual mm -hmm. cramps. Mm -hmm. Or her, her breasts, I mean, they're so tender. I mean, she just, she can't even stand to be hugged. You know, mm -hmm. we want something right now that's going to help her symptoms right. while we're working on her gut. Yeah, beautiful. I, I, I hope my hope is that someday like traditional gynecology can like bring some more of this kind of testing in for women, you know, cause like I get a lot of clients that have had like hysterectomies or partial hysterectomies and it was like mostly for like heavy bleeding. And I'm kind of like, yeah. oh man, I wish that you had had some other options given to you before that. It's just so invasive and, <laughs> you know, so I hope for a day that general care includes some more of this kind of stuff because it's so empowering, you know? Exactly. I mean, for me, I mean, me personally and what, you know, I wish everyone could do is like, I believe in annual blood work. I believe in mm -hmm. an annual stool test. You know, yep. I think it's good to check your micronutrients. I mean, every year, I mean, I'm just kind of going through myself right now where I, yep. I check my micronutrients. I sent off some urine for an organic acids test. I'm going to do my stool test again. You know, I'm just- I just got my blood drawn two days yep. ago and ordered a stool <laughs> test. It's on the way. So. Yep. I mean, I these agree. are things I do myself. It's like, right. this is, I want to make sure that I'm optimizing things yeah. and, you know, keeping yeah. myself healthy. For sure. It's like, you know, we were mandated to do it for our cars or we're not allowed to drive it on the road, but it's like, come on, man, like that car is a piece of junk compared to your body, you know, like t do some tune-ups, check in. Yeah. Don't wait for inspection. it to fall apart and break down in the middle of the road. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for your time. This has been insanely informative. Um, is there anywhere you would like to direct people where they could learn more from you or just resources, et cetera? 
Sure. Yeah, I, I'm not accepting new clients at this time. Mm -hmm. I am more focused on educating practitioners. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a member of the medical education team at Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory that does the GI MAP stool test. So, you know, for practitioners who are listening, you know, if you run a GI MAP stool test and you need some help with interpretation, you can contact Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory and set up a consult with me or another member of the team. Or if you just want to, if you really love this kind of deep dive, you know, <laughs> learning about the GI map or the Dutch, I do have really intensive practitioner courses on both the Dutch test and GI map interpretation. So you can mm -hmm. go to my website. It's basically my last name, Pomeroy, P-O-M-E-R-O-Y, institute.com. So you can do one-on-one -on -one consultations with me as a mentor, practitioner to practitioner, mm -hmm. or find out more information about my courses there. Mm, awesome. Yeah. I highly recommend just based off doing one of yours. It was so, I mean, you guys got the gist on this episode. You're so, um, up to date and passionate and educated. And it's, it's just really appreciated. Thank you for all you do in the industry. And thank you for coming and sharing with us today. No problem. Yep. I, I just don't want, I mean, I suffered greatly with health problems in my youth and I just, you know, have knowing now we have these tools to help people. That's where my passion is to totally. educate practitioners. It's like, everybody needs to know about this. These tests needs to be routine. So I yeah. love to spread the word and just get the, the knowledge out there so we can help as many people as possible. 100%. You're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs>